Question number seven is this. Can some individuals never enter the age of accountability? How does forgiveness of Jesus work with this? Okay, so first of all, let's talk about um, the age of accountability. And um, the age of accountability, that is a term that we have come up with. I don't know who came up with it. I, I you know, can't go back and say it was such and such. Um, but it's really just kind of a, a, a thing that we look at to say, you know, to, to describe a concept of, of um, different things. And to tell you the truth, the only, the only solid biblical basis that I know of, maybe there's something else, but the only solid biblical basis that I know of about the age of accountability is just simply found in um, 1 Samuel chapter uh, 12. We're not going to flip over there and, and look at it, but I'll just refer to the story. Um, but that, that's the only one that, that I can come up with solid and say, yeah, this is what the age of accountability is, and so, or, or, or why we believe it. And you may be thinking, okay, well, what is the age of accountability? Well, the age of accountability is just simply at some point, somebody is going to be aware or conscious of um, their actions, aware, conscious of um, Jesus Christ, of uh, eternal punishment, and so therefore they are accountable uh, for the choices that they make. Before that time, then God protects that person. So if they pass away, then um, you know that when when they die, they they uh, go be with the Lord in heaven. And so the the question is, can some individuals never even enter this this age of accountability? Okay, um, so looking at, not going back and looking at, but just kind of talking about 2 Samuel chapter 12. In this uh, chapter, you remember that uh, David had an affair with Bathsheba and then conspired to have Bathsheba's husband murdered and then took Bathsheba to be his wife. And so uh, that is after uh, she was found out to be pregnant. The, the latter happened, not the first thing that I mentioned because you know, that, that wouldn't make any sense, right? But the affair, the pregnancy, <laughs> and then the conspiracy to murder Uriah, and then taking Bathsheba to be his wife, um, that's how all that laid out. And uh, in chapter 12, we see that the prophet Nathan comes to David and starts to rebuke David about his uh, uh, sin and um, gave David the consequences for what his, his actions were going to cause because you know, David's not just simply somebody out there with no position whatsoever. David is the king of Israel. And so as far as being the king of Israel, um, David's sin affected more than just simply himself and those people in his immediate circle. I mean, it's, it's talking about, since he was the leader of the nation of Israel, it's talking about all of those people. And since Israel was supposed to be a witness to the nations around uh, them, it's all of those people as well. And so... Uh, because of that, you know, the Lord had to have some sort of very public action to show his displeasure with what David had done. Because, I mean, after all, David did some really despicable things. And so one of the things that was going to happen to David was that the child was going to die. All right. And so um, the child got sick. And so for seven days, David put on uh, sackcloth. He fasted. He wept, he prayed, um, and um, just constantly begged the Lord uh, for the Lord to, to spare the child's life. And then the do child died on the seventh day. And um, the servants around David, they didn't want to tell him this because they were afraid if we tell David about this, if he's been this low and this depressed up until this point, you know, telling him about the child dying, that just might put him over the edge. And so they kept it from him. But David heard them, you know, just kind of whispering in the background and just simply point blank asked them, is the child dead? And they said, yes, the child's died. And so from there, we see that David gets up, he gets dressed, he puts on lotions, he goes into the house of the Lord, he worships, he comes back home, and he eats and drinks. Now the servants are, are very alarmed by this you know it's like david you got things backwards you know you, you think that you'd be in mourning after the child dies not before the child dies why and so david's explanation was before he died i thought 
if I ask the Lord, maybe the Lord would be gracious and spares life. But now that the child's dead, I, I can't bring him back, but I will go to be with him. And so there's the idea that David, being a prophet of God, knew that his child was in the presence of God and that there was nothing at that point that would bring the child back to him, but at some point David would go and be with him. Okay, And so there is the idea about um, age of accountability. And when you kind of look at the, the logic of it, it really makes a lot of sense. Okay. Now, the reason why I had this question following the question last week about uh, the Calvinism, the Arminianism, because we started to talk about um, God's choice and we started to talk about general versus limited atonement. And so with the idea about general atonement, we looked at the fact how Jesus Christ was the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. And so what that means is that Jesus Christ paid for all of the world's sins. And so when you stop and think about that, I mean, Jesus paid for the sins of some very despicable um, people, right? Uh, down throughout the centuries. Jesus paid for uh, past sins. Jesus paid for present sins, uh, future sins. Jesus paid for sin, period. And it is upon that that now all of a sudden we, we've got a, a, a different standard, if you will. Instead of reaching that very high standard that nobody can reach, of righteousness, the, the absolute righteousness of God, since all of those sins have been forgiven, now it's a standard of have you believed in Jesus Christ or not? If you believed in Jesus Christ, then that righteousness is applied to you. If you haven't believed in Jesus Christ, then you fall short of the glory of God, the righteousness of God. Now, let's take a look at... Um, Two verses past the, the most famous verse in the Bible. Anybody know what the most famous verse in the Bible is? John 3, 16. So, John 3, 18, to me, expresses this very, very well. John chapter 3, and verse number 18. Okay? So, John chapter 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, or only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting or eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Now we're in verse number 18. You ready? Okay. So in verse number 18, notice it says this. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. So, what we've got here is just simply two different categories, right? Believe and disbelieve. Okay? So, with people who believe... People who disbelieve all right so it's it's very cut and dry okay and it all has to do with the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ because the sins of the entire world have been atoned for and taken care of then all of a sudden it's just it's just this or it's that period right? So now we've got this little baby, bitty baby, okay? David's baby, all right? How can this baby believe in God? He can't. How can the little baby disbelieve? And God. They can't, right? And so that's where we come up with the, the you know, the age of accountability. And it, and it, to me, it really makes a lot of sense. And that is Jesus Christ died for the sins of the whole world. And so because this baby hasn't made a choice one way or another, can't make a choice one way or another because it's not able to, then it's just simply his sins have been paid for. And so um, you know, you're talking about a God who um, loves us. As a matter of fact, God loves this baby. Here, we'll even do this. 
There we go. Isn't that sweet? Um, God loves that baby more than David could, more than Bathsheba could, more than anybody can. And so it really wouldn't be all that loving to say, okay, well, here's this baby. And even though this baby has not reached that age in which they can make that choice, um, we're going to just simply say that it stands uh, on its own merits and it's going to be condemned anyway. Uh, that really does not, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? Okay. And so there is the, the age of accountability. Now, some people say, okay, well, what is that age? I, it's it's got to be different for different people, right? You know, I mean, um, you, you talk to some people who are saved as um, young children. Um, you know, children just mature and grow at, at different rates. Um, you know, I was saved when I was seven years old, uh, almost eight years old. Um, Mackenzie was saved when she was eight, wasn't she? Yeah, and Quentin was saved when... Yeah, Shannon's five, Quentin was six. I mean, you know, so that's, that's pretty young. Um, then again, there's other people who, you know, saved when they're adults. Some people when they're saved is, um, you know, teenagers. And it really doesn't matter what, when somebody is saved as far as the age goes. What really matters is that they are. But the, the real thing is, at what point does a person hit that? And I, I don't know. You know, only God knows. And so... Maybe when they hear about God. Well, we're going to get into that when we talk in, in, with the next question. So well, yeah. hold on about that. Now, what about a dog that maybe, uh, I like to use the word, mental retardation. Have, right. Yeah, with, uh, who, are, who are handicapped. Right. Okay, so that's, that's just the point that I'm driving at here. Right. You know, right. uh, at, at if, if somebody, anybody, is aware of their actions, if they're aware of, of um, God, if they're aware of, of uh, Jesus Christ, and they reject that, well, then definitely so. But at the same time, you know, if somebody doesn't have those capabilities mm -hmm. of then you would think that they would be put right back in the same place as, the, as David's baby, wouldn't you? Right? And so as far as could somebody never reach the age of accountability? Well, I can't really go to the Bible and say, here is an example of somebody who never was. Right? I can't go to the Bible and say, okay, the Apostle Paul said, you know, I can look at it in terms of principle. And that's what we're doing tonight, is we're looking at it in terms of what happened with David's baby. We're looking at it in terms of what is logically uh, going on, what the principle of the matter is, which is simply general atonement, um, or, or really even limited atonement for that matter. But, um, you know, and the, the fact of, of accepting Jesus Christ. And so, you know, when you look at it in that regard, you say, okay, well, it, it does make sense that there could be somebody that, that never even makes that age. But again, that is ultimately for God to judge. And when we say that, we've always got to remember that God loves each and every person more than what we ever could. Yes, Olga? I don't know. I have my patient. He was okay till 25 years old. And then something happened to his brain. And now he's really, you know, mentally disabled, so how about him? Well, again, this is going to have to come back to God because it's going to be his decision. But um, if you think about it, um, you know, if somebody, if somebody went into a stage of their life where they had that capability, and especially if they went into that stage of life and rejected any chances of it, well, you know, Yeah, but then again, in, in, you know, in his mind, he might. Question number eight. Now, by the way, when we look at these questions, um, I'm just going to be honest with you. There's, there are some of these questions that I just really, there's, there's a lot that we just don't know. And in this question is one that I just really don't know. But 
the reason why I want to have this question past the other question is because you can kind of take a similar logic with it, right? And that is, as with an age of accountability where somebody never was able to come to the point of um, having the capacity to accept or reject Jesus Christ, um, here we've got somebody who has never heard the Word of God. Do people who never hear the Word of God go to heaven? Do they get the choice to accept Jesus after they die? Well, the first part of that is, um, you know, like I say, you can kind of accept a, you know, just a similar logic of that John 3:18. Uh, he who believes in me is not condemned. He who does not believe stands condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the, of, um, the one and only Son of God. And so, um, if somebody does not believe. Um, and, and, and does not have the chance to believe, then, you know, there's, there's that. Somebody disbelieves, okay, well, there's that. Um, so you think about somebody who is uh, living on a, an island somewhere, uh, you know, tribal person, uh, somebody who has uh, never heard about Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ has never been taught there, preached there, um, you know, never seen a Bible, um, know nothing, you know, is, well, hold on a second. I know people have got opinions about this. Let me get my opinion out, then you can go on. Um, you know, are they going to, uh, you know, is God going to take them to heaven? Does that match with like the age of accountability? Well, maybe, but at the same time, let's take a look at Romans chapter one and verse number 18. Okay, so in Romans chapter 1, and starting in verse number 18, um, the Apostle Paul starts to talk about the ancient Roman world, the ancient Gentile world, and how God's judgment was upon them. And then in chapter 2, he goes on and talk about uh, the Jews and how God's judgment was upon them. And to tell you the truth, he comes back to the whole thing in, in Romans chapter uh, 3 and verse 23 to say, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so if you take all of this all together, you're going to come back to the point that all, meaning the Jews and the Gentiles, everybody has fallen short of the glory of God. But he starts by talking out to the ancient Gentile world and what happened to them. In verse number 18, he says, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the ungodliness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness, since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. And so, what we've got here is that every single person who has ever walked on the face of the earth um, has a chance to look at the earth and to say, hmm, this place is truly amazing. This place is truly incredible. And, you know, it doesn't matter if they were, you know, tribal people. It doesn't matter if they are, um, you know, uh, renowned scientists. Uh, people pretty much, when they look at the earth, they say this place is pretty incredible, right? And so one thing that should be very plain about all this is when you look at this incredible place, is it should tell you that, hey, this has been made by a pretty incredible person, right? And that is that when you look at this in verse number 20, it says, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen. And so when you look at the creation, you say, hey, this has been created by someone and that someone, that creator, is two things. Number one is that he has eternal power, and number two, he is divine, right? And so there is the idea that it is a credit and giving credit to God. But these people in the ancient Gentile world, they were people who were suppressing the truth by their wickedness. And so here is the truth of God, but instead of wanting to turn to the truth of God, what they were doing is they were turning to other things. And you can go on down and, and read in verse 21 that they, uh, although they knew God, they never glorified Him or gave Him thanks, but in their 
uh, thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. And so here is the Creator and they chose to worship the creation rather than the Creator and then they continue to go on from there. All right. And so, you know, kind of going back to our, our guy on the island, um, is he without um, um, excuse? No, he's not. But at the same time, when you look at creation, you can't see John 3.16 in a uh, pine cone. Right? So, uh, this is one of those things that, you know, I can, I can kind of see both sides of it. I mean, I can see that, no, people don't, you know, they don't have an excuse because of God and His creative power. But at the same time, you know, for people who have never understood Jesus Christ, you know, what, what is God going to do with them? And upon that note, I'm very comfortable to say, hey, wait a minute, I'm not the judge, you're not the judge, none of us are really the judge, God's the judge, yeah. right? And again, going back to the idea that God loves each and every one of us more than we can ever love ourselves. And so, you know, the, the tribal guy there, um, you know, never, Jesus Christ has never been there. Um, you know, God loves him and God cares about him. You say, okay, well, could God reveal himself to him in other ways? Well, maybe so. I don't know. I wasn't there. Um, you know, you, you hear stories of, uh, you know, Native Americans before um, settlers came into the area of, of just talking about the Great Spirit. You know, it was that their way of recognizing God. I don't know. I didn't talk to them. You know, I, I, I have no idea. But that's God's uh, judgment in my estimation. And I, I think that there are a lot of people who like to um, use this as an excuse of saying, oh, well, you, what, what you're telling me about Christ, th that really doesn't apply because what about these, you know, the American Indians? What about so on and so forth? So it's kind of like, well, I don't know about them, but I know about you because I just told you about the gospel, right? And so that, that kind of puts you in the boat. Now you got to make the choice. And so... Now, as far as, um, you know, globally speaking, you know, it's really amazing. I, um, Shannon and I watched this uh, program. It's on a, several years ago about these uh, British guys that will go into these far-reaching places, um, you know, and, and tap into these um, um, Pacific Islanders, people that, that you know, um, humanity, civilization hasn't had any contact with, so to speak. And so, you know, they'd get to know them, then they'd live with them, you know, and it was kind of, it was really interesting documentary. I forgot what the name of that was. Um, yeah, I remember one name was Ollie. I don't know, remember the other one. But um, anyway, here they're with these um, uh, Pacific Islanders, you know, never been around people um, for all this time. And then, uh, you know, like about the uh, sixth show, lo and behold, oh, well, we know about the Bible because this missionary used to come in. And... <laughs> But anyway. Yeah, I mean, one episode they even had like a tent, uh, almost like a church, like the missionary had built everything there and they, they knew all of that. Yeah. So that was interesting. That is. All right. Okay. So, like I said, I know that everybody, a lot of people have opinions about what, what do you guys think about this? I think God will make that decision. Right. I'm not going to. I'm sorry. It's hard to argue with that, isn't it? And it's yeah. comforting to know we don't have to worry about it. Okay. Except we have to worry about sharing. Okay. Yeah. I was going to say this, it points out the importance of missions. It does. Because the only way to know if they're going to go to heaven is to tell them the gospel. That's right. You know, we don't know about anyone. No. no. Well, we could have Satan sitting right here. Yes. Okay. Okay. Well, no, we don't know. And that's right. And the Bible talks about the Lord knows who's, uh, who's his own. Because we don't know what everybody's heart is, you know. I mean, the, the disciples, they had Judas Iscariot right there in their midst, and they didn't know it. But we are accountable for sharing, like Chloe's saying. You, right. If you have an opportunity and you pass it up, it's on me. I've had that happen. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. Nobody else has an opinion on about that? Okay. I, I guess, like, to see it either way, because part of it, like, 
maybe this is just my mind, but if God's going to, if, if they don't ever have the opportunity to hear it, and God's going to let them go to heaven because they never got that opportunity, oh. if I tell them and then they deny it, and then now they're going to go to hell, so should, maybe I just shouldn't tell them. Okay, <laughs> well, now, yeah, so... But I know yeah. that's wrong. This is just my brain. That's right. Well, okay, so now that would be, you know, an, an, a faulty conclusion that you could draw from this of we should not go to anyone. We should not uh, be a part of any kind of international uh, mission because um, that could be for the better of them. No, no, no. That's not what God wants for us. It's not what, at the same time, um, we can't look at it, we can't look at any of this and say that, that somehow we are responsible for the determination if somebody goes to heaven or hell. You know, that doesn't make any sense either. I'm not going to tell you about the gospel because I don't like you and I want you to go to hell. No, that's not it. You know, it, 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 it doesn't work that way. Well, um, you're saying in Roman nature itself tells you that they're not as good for not to believe. And there's no excuse for people not to believe, but we're still called to share, share our faith. That's right. And, and that's what God wants for us to do. Yeah. And so that's what we should do. Now, there is a second part to this question that I had um, kind of overlooked, and that is, uh, do they get the choice to accept Jesus after they die? And so, you know, that is after you die, is that, oh, now we're going to tell you about Jesus Christ, and now you get to accept. No, um, take a look at, by the way, hold your place there in Romans. We're going to be coming back there um, eventually. Yeah. Okay, but if you take a look at Hebrews chapter 9 and verse number 27. All right, Hebrews. Towards the end of the New Testament. If you see 1st, 2nd, 3rd John or James, 1st and 2nd Peter, you've gone too far. Okay. So, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, just a quick little verse here. It says, just as man is destined to die once and after that face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people, and he will appear a second time not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Okay, and so there's two parts of this, and that is there's a comparison. And that is just as something, then so Christ. And so just as something, and the something is, is expressed to be a true statement, is that man is destined to die once and then after that face judgment. And so Christ was destined to die once but not face judgment, but instead to come back and bring salvation. That's the, the intent of the passage. But you look at that first part in verse number 27, it, it's every man's destiny, every person's destiny to die. You know, I, I, I know I'm a broken record, but I, I love the old Stephen Wright joke. Of I know I'm going to die because my birth, uh, um, birth certificate has an expiration date on it. <laughs> so, I mean, you think about it. Uh, even though your your birth certificate does not have an expiration date on it, um, we do have an expiration date on us, and you know we we are all going to die. And what happens after we die? We face judgment. You know, there is not the idea about dying. And then, you know, going around and finding our way and doing this and doing that and coming back and uh, haunting people on Halloween. Halloween's coming up. Ooh. Trick or treat. Trick or treat. Spooky. No, 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 no. None of that. Um, instead, it's just when somebody dies, they face judgment. There's only one or two ways that they go. And that's all that there is to it. And so uh, for someone to say, okay, well, after I die, I don't want to know about Jesus now because... I'm going to wait until after I die, and then after I die, then I'm going to find out for sure, and then I can make my choice. No, it doesn't it's work that late. way. It's too late. You know, that's not belief. That's just uh, trying to. <laughs> that's just trying to fudge the, the thing. Okay. Okay. Next question. Question number nine. Why did God give the Old Testament law knowing that people could not fulfill it except for Jesus? Okay, 
So why did God give the Old Testament law? Well, that's, now this is where we go back to the book of Romans, all right? Yep, Romans chapter 3 and verse number 20. Romans chapter 3 and verse number 20 gives us in very plain, simple details why we've got the Old Testament law. Now, to kind of give you a, a reminder about what the Old Testament law was, in the Old Testament you've got God who comes and makes a covenant with a nation of people, the nation of Israel. And the Old Testament law was the terms of that covenant. The covenant was, I'm going to be your God and you're going to be my people if you do what I say. The law was what God said. Okay? And so the law was that terms of uh, God's people. Okay. Now, that was the practical side of the law, but the spiritual side of the law is this right here. Romans chapter 3 and verse number 20, it says, well, we go back to verse number 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and that the whole world may be held accountable to God. So there's more of that accountability to God, not just simply by his creator, but because of what the law says. It says, therefore, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we became conscious of sin. And so the intent, the spiritual intent of God giving the law was never to make people righteous. The intent of the law was to really prove that people were, were unrighteous. Okay? That was Romans chapter 3 and verse 20. Okay? So the intent was, it doesn't make you righteous. The intent is that it proves that you are unrighteous. Okay? And so that is why God gave a law that nobody could, could keep. And it's not that God gave a law that nobody could keep. It's not like He's given us a test that is so tough and difficult to do it. It's just that it's not in our capabilities because we're sinners. Right? If we weren't a sinner, we wouldn't have a problem with keeping the law. It would be very easy because we would be righteous. But because we are sinners by nature, we just can't do it. It's not possible. But if you just come up to people and say, hey, you know what? You're a sinner. You cannot live up to the standard and the measure of God. They're probably going to say, says you, <laughs> I think I'm a pretty good person and I think I can do it. Right? And if you stop and think about it, you know, when we're just going through our lives, hey, we are pretty good people, right? You know, we, we do good things and we're nice people and so on and so forth. And, you know, we worship God a little bit and, and do the good stuff and, you know, everything like that. So after all, why, why wouldn't God accept us for who we are? That's where you've got to have that law in place, right? And the law in place is not to say, hey, you guys are doing a good job. That law in place is to say, no, you guys are not doing a good job. What you guys need is you guys need help. <laughs> you need somebody to help you out here. And so there it is that it is um, meant to, to, to show your failures, what it is. And so the Ten Commandments, those Ten Commandments are part of the Old Testament law. And you can go down through those Ten Commandments and say, oh, yeah, I did this and this and this and this and this and this. And this. But when you really are honest with yourself and you really start to think about it, you really start to say, well, no, I've never murdered anybody, but I have been really mad at somebody before and wished they were dead. Okay? No, I've never committed adultery before, but I sure have lusted in my heart. All right? You know, it's interesting that of all of those things, of, you know, of the actions... You come down to that last one, and you could even fool yourself and say that you're okay, but when you get down to that last one, you got a lot of trouble, don't you? Because that's something that really strikes to the heart, and that is you shall not covet. Covet is something that you, you, you know, it's not necessarily an action that you do, um, but it's a, an emotion that you have, right? And so you, you take just those ten little things, those little summary statements of what the law is about, and you see, hey, we're, we're not there. But here we've got another part of the law, and the other part of the law is Jesus Christ. So let's take a look at um, Ma uh, Matthew chapter 17, or excuse me, chapter 5 and verse 17. I'm sorry. Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 17. So this is what Jesus said in regards to 
the law. All right, so Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 17. He says, or he said, Do not think I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Okay? So you think about the law and the prophets, and you think about how Jesus was going to fulfill the prophets. We can see that really easily, can't we? I mean, what we could do is we just look and we can say, oh yeah, Jesus, here's this prophecy about the Christ, Jesus did it. So we fulfilled that, that prophecy. Here's a prophecy about the Christ, Jesus did it. So we fulfilled that prophecy. And when you look at all those prophecies, you see Jesus fulfilled them, then you say, oh, well, that's pretty obvious that Jesus is the Christ. That's what Paul did when he went into the Jewish synagogues. Um, he, would, he would show from the Old Testament scriptures how Jesus was the Christ. But there was another way that Jesus did that, is that he came to fulfill the law. And so of all the requirements that the, the law had, Jesus fulfilled them. And so of all the things that we could not do, Jesus came and he did them. What that does is that it shows that he was the Christ. And it was necessary for the Christ to go and fulfill the law because it was necessary for that sacrifice that Jesus was going to make to be an acceptable sacrifice. So all of those sacrifices in the Old Testament, they were supposed to be without spot and without blemish. And so if you had a lamb that had some kind of defect, had some kind of spot, it would not have been an acceptable sacrifice. It had to be something that was whole, something that was perfect because it was supposed to shadow, uh, show what, um, um, Christ was supposed to do. And what Christ is supposed to do is that he was going to come and he was going to be a perfect sacrifice for us morally. You know, we sin, we can't go to heaven. Instead, the wages of sin death. Jesus, on the other hand, Jesus doesn't sin. But because he doesn't sin and he goes and he dies on Calvary's cross, he is a suitable substitute. Okay? And so when you look at the law and kind of getting back to this question, why did God give the Old Testament law? Well, a couple of different reasons. Number one is to point out our sin. And number two, it is really to point out how Jesus Christ is our Savior and how He can be our acceptable sacrifice. Anybody have any questions on that? The Old Testament teaches a lot about paying debts for debts, like an eye for an eye, but the New Testament teaches about having um, forgiveness, like te uh, turning the other cheek. Why is the difference? Okay, so since we're in Matthew, let's go on to Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 38. Okay, Matthew chapter 5, verse 38. All right, so... It says in verse 38, You have heard that it was said, An eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on your right cheek, turn to him the other also. Okay? So, what we need to understand is that what Jesus is saying is that here you have heard that it was said a, a bit in peace from the Old Testament law. But, I'm here to tell you that this is what real true righteousness is all about. Now, that little bit in peace that the Jews like to talk about, and in this case of the Old Testament, the, the eye for the eye, the tooth for the tooth, originally it was meant to show that the punishment had to fit the crime, or the, uh, yeah, the punishment had to fit the crime. Um, here is this law that was given to the Old Testament Israelites, and that law was not just simply their, their, their religious law, that law was also their, their uh, civil law as well. And so that expression, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, um, what that meant is that if someone were to go and be injurious to someone, then the punishment that was meted out to them had to be of equal value. You can't have greater punishment than what is there or it is not justice. And you can't have lesser punishment for the, what is there, or it's not justice, right? You know, if you're going to have something that is fair and honest and just, the punishment has got to meet the crime. So when you take that in a national sense, it kind of makes a lot of uh, 
sense, right? But if you take that and apply it to an individualized sense, then you got a lot of problems. The Jews were taking it, not just simply in a national sense, but in Jesus' day, they were taking it and then putting it into a, um, an individualized sense. And so what they were saying is that if you come and you do something to me, then God gives me the right to do something back to you. If you come and you poke me in the eye, then God expects me to poke you back in the eye as well. If you come and you knock out my tooth, then God wants me to give you a knuckle sandwich and knock yours out as well. Now that's the way that they took it. And the reason why they were took it, taking it that way is because they were wanting to take a, something that should have been applied nationally and they were wanting it to be applied um, individually. Okay? And so that's why Jesus said, but I tell you, if someone strikes you on the cheek, offer him the other one. Right? Because what's really going on is that what Jesus wants his disciples to show is some characteristics and traits of the new covenant. Okay? And so the old covenant, if you go back to the book of Hebrews, chapter 13, Or excuse me, chapter 12, Hebrews chapter 12, and verse number 18. Hebrews chapter 12, and in verse number 18, you see a contrast between verse number 18 through verse number 21, contrasted from verse 22 through verse number 24. In verse number 18, it says, You have not come to a mountain that can, uh, can be touched, and that is burning with fire to darkness, gloom and storm, to a trumpet blast, or to such a voice speaking words that uh, those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them, because they could not bear what was uh, commanded. Even if an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. And so we read that and we go, what in the world it's talking about? Well, you go back to the book of Exodus, chapter 19, you see that when God gave the law and made the covenant with the Old Testament Israelites, this is what the scene was. And that, that, that smoke and darkness descended upon Mount Sinai to the point that people were fearful. There was lightning and thunder and, and, and rumblings like earthquakes and and the voice of God was booming from the darkness. And, um, you know, they set up uh, barriers around the mountains so that people wouldn't come approach it. And if anything, even an animal approached it, they were going to be stoned. It was so bad that even Moses was afraid, right? And Moses went up on top of that mountain. Okay. And so here's, here's the idea, okay? When you look at verses 18 through 22... What word do you think of? That's it, isn't it? Death. Okay. But, again, what does the law do? The law points out sin, and the wages of sin is what? Death. Death. Okay. Now, we don't, he's saying, you haven't come to that. Instead, in verse number 22, he says, But you have come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of our living God. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all men, to the spirits of righteous men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks of a better word than the blood of Abel. Okay? So you look at that, and what word do you think that is characterized? Life, right? Okay. And so here is, it's not that God is a different God. You know, the God of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament. There, there is no difference. God is unchangeable. But it's that the Old Testament sometimes becomes very harsh because the law, and the law is there to point out death. The New Testament, on the other hand, is very forgiving because the new covenant that we have with God is very forgiving because it shows life. All right? And so 
you know, some people, if they want to go and they, they want to take things, uh, you know, for example, in the Old Testament, if they want to apply them individually, then it, it doesn't make any sense. And at the same time, if somebody goes and takes some of the things in the New Testament and applies it nationally, it doesn't make any sense either. You know, there's some people say, oh, well, you Christians, how can you be kind and forgiving and loving and at the same time vote for a president that wants to take us to war? Well, because the two things are not the same. You know, we, we, we are, you know, trying to live out forgiving. We are trying to be, live out loving. At the same time, we understand that as far as the nation goes, which is completely, totally different than our religious feelings, is that, you know, sometimes we need to defend ourselves. And the president says, hey, we need to go to war to defend ourselves, then so be it. But sometimes you hear that, right? You know, oh, well, you, you Christians, you, can't, you believe the Bible, but yet you do that. That doesn't really sound all that loving to me. Well, it's, it's because it's not the same. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. All right. Anybody have any questions or comments on that one? No? Okay. Well, we did better than last week, I think. We, I think we got, got through four. Okay. Dear Lord in heaven, we thank you for your blessings. We thank you for this uh, time that we spent in your word. And Lord, please... Um, Take your word and apply it to our hearts. Lord, please forgive us of our sins and please bring us back until we meet again. Lord, please be with us and help us to be witnesses and examples. And please forgive us where we fail you. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.